Thank you, Levi and Taylor. Again, thank you to Brad McDonald and uh, the Quest team for set, going to all the trouble to set this up. Thank you for you to you for taking the time to carve out time. Undoubtedly, there are things you could be doing, and there may be a list of things you need to get to post haste. But uh, nonetheless, we're here, and and I want to thank you for making yourself available to uh, the Lord and giving me the honor of uh, doing this with you over this last couple hours. I am, as an experienced pastor, acutely aware of uh, the dynamics of an after-lunch session. With that in mind, this will be the shortest of what we've done thus far, but it doesn't mean it's the least important. So just, I was thinking about it, I was at the back thinking, what was the, what was the toughest after lunch crowd I ever dealt with? And, and I, I remember it specifically. I was, um, I was doing a youth camp in uh, Abilene, Texas. And uh, well, actually it wasn't a youth camp, it was a family camp. And so the dynamic was, it's like 111 degrees, it's just beastly hot. We're in an outdoor uh, covered area that has no windows, so it's horribly hot. It's super distracting because everything is open and the rest of the camp is functioning while I'm trying to uh, uh, marshal the troops of the, this group of young people into some sort of something or other. And, uh, and, it was, it, and it was right after lunch and the next thing on the agenda was swimming. <laughs> It, it was like the most dreadful, like, oh, over here, oh, okay, okay, over here, young people, okay, do you? It, was, it, was, uh, it was dreadful, but uh, we got through it and trust that seeds were sown way back in the day, Abilene, Texas. <laughs> I want to take a moment uh, just in preparation for concluding. I want to read you the entirety of what we've gone through. And I want you just to settle under the word of God. Close your eyes if you must and envision and just allow this to wash over you. Let's, let's capture the entirety. Now that we know what we've known, we've seen what we've seen, and we've kind of partnered with the Lord, let's let this, this thing wash over us. So I'm going to go back a little bit further. I'm going to edit a little bit as I go, but I'm going to read basically three and four of Exodus to you. Let's let this wash over us. One day, Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am. Moses replied, do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals for you are standing on holy grounds where we've been this weekend. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, And when Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the the Egyptians. This is so current, by the way. And lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. It's the promise of God. The land where the Canaanites and the Hittites and the rest of them now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me. And I've seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. And here it begins. But Moses protested to God, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? And God answered, I will be with you. This is your sign that I am the one who has sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt. You will worship God at this very mountain. And it continues. But Moses protested. 
If I go to the people of Israel and tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? And God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, the I am has sent you to me. Chapter four. But Moses protested again. What if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say, the Lord never appeared to you? And then the Lord asked him, what's that in your hand? A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. Throw it down on the ground, the Lord told him. So Moses threw down the staff and it turned into a snake. And Moses jumped back and the Lord told him, reach out and grab its tail. And Moses reached out and grabbed it and it turned back into a shepherd's staff in his hand. Perform this sign, the Lord told them, and they will believe that the Lord, the Lord God of, the, of your ancestors, the God, God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, really has appeared to you. But Moses pleaded with the Lord, oh please, oh please, I'm not very good with words. I never have been, and I'm not even now. Even though you have spoken to me, I get tongue-tied, my words get tangled. The Lord asked Moses, who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or not speak? Hear or do not hear? See or do not see? It is I, the Lord. Now go, I will be with you as you speak, and I will instruct you what to say. And thus shows up the fifth I in our list. Inferiority. But Moses again pleaded, Lord, please send anyone else, anyone but me. Send anyone else. Send anyone else. And here's the thing, gentlemen. In your life, in your circumstance, the short answer is, there is no one else. You can wish till the cows come home. Send someone else to be strengthened my marriage. Send someone else to parent my children. Send someone else to serve in the church. Send someone else to share Christ with the neighbors. Anybody but me, please, please, please. After I've ex exhausted every other argument, Moses pulls out the trump card of inferiority and says, literally, Anybody else but me, I am that useless. Anyone but me, just a warm body. I don't, I don't care, just anybody but me. That vain hope that somebody else might do the work that only you can do in the ground and in the place that God has placed you. There is no one else. There is no one else. There is no one else. There is no one else that we're waiting for who is more spiritual than you that will pray for the needs of your family because you know them best. We're waiting for someone more talented than me to step in and teach or to serve or to lead anybody but me, anybody but me. I'm waiting till someone wealthier than I will give and relieve the burden that the church carries. I could, but I won't. Someone else needs to do it. I'm waiting till someone bolder, smarter, more articulate than I shares Christ with the neighbors. Surely somebody else will step up at some point, won't they? Waiting for someone more learned to come and read the word for me. Pastor, spoon feed me on Sunday mornings. Give me the words of life because I cannot or will not search them myself. Oh, and by the way, pastor, if you don't preach to my satisfaction, I'll leave for the church down the road next Sunday, just so you're aware. The vain hope that the youth pastor will direct my children. The vain hope that the therapist will save my marriage. Pastor Corey taught me this, this uh, very, very valuable lesson a while ago, and we've been talking about it for a while. There is a seat of spiritual authority that God offers to every man, and in many homes it remains vacant. Yes. Oh, Lord, anybody but me. Anybody but me. Now, we know from the story, and it's kind of, 
cute in its own way. The Lord then became angry with Moses. He finally tired after five whining sessions that got to the point where his inferiority was so massive, anybody but me. And the Lord said, listen, okay, we'll use your brother, which mostly ended up okay, but not as good as it could have been. The Lord finally relented and said, okay, but we're gonna do this and you're gonna come with me. Whether you like it or not, we're gonna do this together. There's a very old, often used template to assist in overcoming spiritual inferiority. And I'm gonna share it with you now. Many of you have probably heard it before and indeed the corny jokes that go with it, so I will spare those for you, but I'll give you three things. This is probably the only list giving I'm gonna do right now to give you three things that you can kind of hang your hat on to action in order to stand up to the five eyes that so desperately want to cripple you and, the, and the, the fullness of what God wants to do in you. Again, you may have heard these before, but the best advice I could give you, my friends, on overcoming those things which are common to us all are to be faithful, to be available, and to be teachable. There's nothing more fancy than that. That's where anointing comes from, by the way. The humility and the simplicity of simply saying, God, I am here at your beck and call. Here I am, send me. Whatever it looks like, whatever the moment is, I'm here. I'm available, I'm listening, and I'm teachable. Almost all the great Bible stories start with that dialogue. Who can we send? I guess I'll go. I can go. And I struggled with this inferiority for many years. In fact, it probably wasn't, I'm 66 now, it probably wasn't 10 years ago that I still legitimately had the sense in my heart and spirit as I learned to pastor this church that if the real leader shows up, please someone let me know and I will step aside. Because I was laboring under the misconception Anybody but me. Anybody but me. And then I realized one day exactly the words that I'm speaking. Remember I said last session, I'm speaking to myself first and foremost. I realized the Lord looking at me, kind of tapping the table like he was with Moses. There isn't anybody else. Dopey. <laughs> there is. I called you. I called you for this most important task. Pastor Derek did such a brilliant job last week. Though you might think little of yourself, though you want to disqualify yourself, you're the one I chose. See, I used to wonder as far as life issues were concerned, and I remember asking the Lord with regards, and I'm sorry, bro, if I'm you know, laboring too much on the story because we have that deal that I don't, but thank you for giving me the okay. When we were in the midst of our journey, the, the darkest days with Brody, I remember one time being angry with God and saying, why on earth would you give us this son? Why did you give him to us? Why couldn't have you sent him to someone more capable? Someone who has a background in addiction, someone who has more experience, someone who's not a pastor. Some, why could you have not, if you're that clever and you, you orchestrate our lives the way you say you do, why on earth would you choose us and him and put us together? And again, that sense of incredulousness that the Lord has in his voice when he deals with me oftentimes. And he, again, like, really? I gave him to you because I knew you could do it. I knew you could do it. I asked him the same question when we were almost finished this build, this building. And it was overwhelming. And I wanted out more than anything. I wanted out. I, this is too hard. It's too expensive. There's too many naysayers. It's too difficult. Everyone is just thinking I'm nuts and we're nuts. And I can't do it. I can't. Why on earth did you ask me to do this, Lord? Exactly the same answer with exactly the same incredulousness. Why would I ask you to do it? Because I knew you could. And then he said, because I knew you weren't going to build a bronze statue out to, out to yourself out in front. Say, look what I did. Look what I did. <laughs> it's not about that. And I've always understood that. This is, just to close off that discussion, this place exists for the glory of God 
and for the salvation of those people. Amen. Any other questions? Nothing more, nothing less. It has always only and singularly been an exercise of faith and continues to be so to this day. Do not overcomplicate it. That's why we're here. Be thou my vision indeed. Very quickly. Each of these three things on their own is very significant, but three together, it's an unstoppable force, and I'm convinced of that. These three simple things. Number one, to be faithful. Pastor Corey spoke about it briefly before. What are the first words you will hear from Jesus when you walk through heaven's gates, whatever they look like, and you meet him face to face? What's the first thing you'll hear? Sorry? My which servant? Faithful. 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 Not my flashy. Not my intelligent. Not my spiritual. The number one, the very first things out of the mouth of your Savior as he looks into your eyes is he notices your faithfulness. And that is the starting point of healthy spirituality for people of God. Faithful. Faithful. Well done, good and faithful. Servant, Matthew 25, 21. Man, I was so blessed to have a faithful dad. Wish you guys could have met my dad. Oh, a couple of you did. Some, some of you knew my dad. Oh, my goodness. Funny. Just quietly, dryly funny. He taught me above everything else. I watched his life. He was a carpenter. He taught me that you can live a Christian life, son. It can be done. And it, it can be done beautifully. You can nail this thing. It doesn't have to be fancy or spectacular. But my dad taught me to be faithful first and foremost. Not fancy, not spectacular, not flashy. Faithful. Some would even say that faithfulness is not terribly spiritual, to which I would push back. I believe it's one of the most spiritual things we can do. As I am at this stage of life, I have uh, young pastors often come to me and say, how did you do it? How did you make it this far? My answer is very simple. I just kept on showing up after everybody quit. There's been lots of times I wanted to quit. But I was determined in my heart that I was going to be faithful. I had a tough time with the Lord a little while ago where the pressures were just so overwhelming in life and in church and all the stuff that the mantle of carrying the leadership load that only a senior pastor knows. I don't say that for any kind of, aren't I special? It just is what it is. And I was talking to the Lord about how I'd like to retreat. I'd like to quit. And he stopped. He paused. He wasn't incredulous this time. He was just very level. He said, but Terry, I thought we had an agreement to finish this well. We did, Lord. I'm sorry. Give me in my weakness your strength. Give me in my ignorance, ignorance my foolishness, your courage and your wisdom. Help me to be faithful to the end. Help me to be faithful. And that is my prayer. Whatever your life looks like, determine in your heart, first and foremost, above everything else, be faithful. Do you know who I love? And it's not a person, it's a group of people. More than anybody else in this beloved church that I'm called to pastor. And I love them all. Warts and all. When I get all that, I'm not blind to these things. I love have a special place in my heart for those who just keep on showing up in spite of their brokenness. And, they're, and they walk in with a limp and they leave with a limp and that's okay. I love people like Warren Lowers who show up week after week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade. You can count on me to be here. It's a flashy but boy, is it powerful. Oh, it's breathtaking when you're around it. Thank you, Warren. It means the world to me. Couldn't have done it without you. And so many others. I know I'm missing other people when I say that. I apologize. 
to be available. To be the one who says. It could be as simple as, you know what? We need some help putting chairs and tables away today. Well, eh. Saves me going home to the dirty dishes at home. I can help with that. I'm available. I can do that. And even with physical limitations, which I now have. I mean, my knees, I'm a, I guess at some point I'll probably have to have knee replacement because in this cold, wet weather the last little while, my knees are screaming with pain. My biggest fear right now in life is that I'm going to trip walking up the steps in church on Sunday morning when I go to preach. That is like a real, real, like I concentrate really hard, like one foot up, another foot up, right? But I want to be available, and if I can, I will. I watched my wife, who was one of the most available people I've ever known, make chicken soup, We'll walk it over to our beloved elder Rosemary, who is struggling with a cancer diagnosis. Walk over in the snow the other night to bring your chicken soup. Because she asked, could you? So she did. To be available. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. To just be present. To live your Christian life with a sense of, I am open for business, Jesus, and I'm ready to respond. When there's a move of God, I'm in. And, I'm, and I know we're all busy. I'm, I know I'm in the privileged place now where life is slowing down a little bit and I have a bit more time. I know the busyness of child rearing and all that kind of stuff. But really not talking about those kind of things. That they're not insignificant coming to prayer meetings, those kinds of things. I want to be available for those too. But life's demands don't work and stuff don't always make that possible. But availability is a heart condition much more than it is a lived out thing. My heart is I would be there if I could and I will help if I can, even if I literally can't be there. Finally, to be teachable. I learned this long ago that the people that make the biggest impact on me the quickest are those who are teachable. I have spent, as you can imagine, countless, countless hours with individuals, counseling, talking, discipling, pastoring, all those kinds of things. And I will give my time almost without restriction to someone that I ascertain is teachable because they're listening, they respond. What I have, as I get older, less patience for is the person who comes through my counseling door and we go over the same stuff week after month after week after year. Listen, I'm free. Go pay some, some, someone some money who needs to make that off you. I do not have the patience. If you're not willing to move, I love you, but I don't see a lot of hope here. Teachability, to be teachable. I try, and it really is an antidote to arrogance and pride to be teachable. I try to enter every interaction with a heart to learn something from everyone in every circumstance. Every person I talk to, I'm trying to learn. I want to learn from you. To be teachable. Psalm 25, 4, teach me your path. Psalm 119, 12, teach me your decrees. Psalm 119, 66, teach me your knowledge. Job 6, 24, teach me and I will be quiet. Show me where I have been wrong. Job 34, 32, teach me what I cannot see. Psalm 119, 29, teach me your law. Psalm 27, 11, teach me your way. Oh, to be teachable to come before with others into church on a Sunday, to open my Bible and my private devotions. Teach me for I need to learn. Faithful, available, teachable. Nothing fancier than that. That's what God is calling us to. And how do I know we can do this, that I can do this? Because Jesus lives in me and those are his primary attributes. He's faithful, he's available, and he's a teachable teacher. Always learning, always caring about us. Philippians 4, in conclusion, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
I can do all things in the face of identity. Who am I? I can do that. Ignorance, I don't know. I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. Insecurity, I can enter that because I can do all things through Christ. Insufficiency, I can embrace that because I can do all things through Christ. And finally, inferiority. That's okay. I can step into that because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Here's how I'm going to wrap up for the day. And there is no swimming to come, just so you know. There's a communion uh, table at the back and over here. And uh, I, I think the best and most appropriate way that we could wrap up this little weekend session is to just partake in the blood and the body of Jesus together as men. And uh, just I'll kind of I'll just lead the timing of that, but I'm going to set you free to either serve yourself here or serve yourself over here. We'll do that together, and then I know we have some uh, dedicated men who prepared diligently for this weekend for the opportunity to pray specifically with people should you have any needs here today. And I would consider myself as part of that team. And Brad, you know who those people are. You know who those people are if you're one of those people. If you need someone to pray specifically and anointedly into your life over specific life issues or whatever's going on, let's do that today. We are going to wrap up plenty early. We're in good shape time-wise. Uh, so let's do that together. Um, and I'll, like I say, I'll kind of, kind of shepherd the, the communion part. We'll do that together. And then we'll go to prayer for anyone who's looking for that. And we have time that we can linger in this moment and be present for that. Sound reasonable? Okay. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Why did you ask me to do this? Because I knew you could do it. Um, I love you guys. I love it. It's been the greatest, greatest privilege of pastoring for all these years. And to call you friends. I'm such a rich, rich man. You're my friends, and I love that more than anything. Let's seek the Lord in communion now. If you will, someone take the covers off those trays back there. Have the strength of God to commission the things that he's called you to do. Because I know you can do it. Let's eat together. I love Bryce's uh, opening line that he was sitting here uh, kind of confessing to the Lord. He was going to the Lord and the first thing is, Lord, for the stuff that I've done. And, and then I love that you added, and if you hadn't, I would have added it for you. And then to ask for his forgiveness, that we make that available. This represents, just think about it, the forgiveness of God. God Almighty, represented in this little cup, is his wrath satisfied? The punishment that had to be meted out for sin. It's not, it's not benign. It's not just this, oh, well, this, you know, this kind of sad feeling in the world that's called sin. And it must be reckoned with. And praise God, it has been reckoned once and for all. We are forgiven, and so we avail ourselves again of the forgiveness of God. Jesus, wash us, body, soul, mind, and spirit for everything we have done and everything we will do because we're human. Let's drink together and thank him. Well, I'm done. <laughs> Tonight I will sleep. <laughs> Brad, how do you want to do the praying? What do you think? Um, right for the front. So anyone who is one of the prayer team members, uh, just identify yourself, come up, stand up here. And anyone who wants prayer for anything, uh, just come on up here and these guys will pray for you. I'll hang around for a bit. You want to have a chat? I'd love that. 
And uh, maybe that'll lead to a, a coffee date, you and me sitting talking about the things that matter. I'd like that too. I owe you one, Clarence. We're, we're up next. <laughs> bless you. In the name of Jesus, I bless you, each and every one. Thank you so much for being here and allowing me to have a look into your hearts. As far as I'm concerned, we're dismissed other, other than this good stuff that's going to happen now. So, yeah, thanks.